Welcome to the AP Physics 1 video lecture. Here I will be covering centripetal forces. In particularly, I am going to be looking at the vertical direction. So the centripetal force situation. This is a ride in Disneyland, California Adventures. Here, um, the loop that the roller coaster can go over behaves like a circle. There are two main points that the ball or cart or roller coaster can be. Right? It can enter here, which is right on the bottom, or it can be directly on top, like if it was a car or a ball on top of a circle. What I would like you to do is label the forces at the two locations. From the body end, you see that the force of gravity is going down and force normal is pointing inwards. The force normal is longer because it's what is going to keep the object going in the circle. If the force normal wasn't longer, the object would not go into this, would not revolve around the circle. That's next. This should give you a hint on what the force centripetal is. Here, the summation of FR, or you could write it as FC, is equal to the normal force minus the gravitational force. Force centripetal is M, acceleration centripetal, and you make the substitution here. Now we're gonna look at it from the top view. Force of gravity is pointing down, and it's on top, so force norm is going upwards. Here, the force gravity is bigger. The reason why is because force of gravity is what's keeping it in the circle. It's the same letters, but now the FG is larger, and the FN is smaller. So on top of the vertical loop, it's FG minus N. And it's the same substitution here. I would like you to spot the difference between the bottom of the vertical loop and the top of the vertical loop. The realization that I want you to come up with is this. The centripetal force, when it is on the bottom of the vertical loop, is supplied largely by the normal force. The normal force is what's keeping it in its circular path. But when it is on top of the vertical loop, the centripetal force is supplied largely by the force of gravity. That is the difference between these two. There are only two forces acting in this situation, force normal and force gravity. And depending on its location on the circle, one of them is going to be larger and one of them is going to be smaller. The next situation arises from the top of the inside of the vertical loop. What I have here is number two, which was on top of the vertical loop. And when, when it was on top of the vertical loop, we saw it was force gravity minus N. The force of gravity was longer. But what happens when the object now is on the inside of the vertical loop? Force of gravity is still pushing it down, but what direction is force normal in? Force normal is the same length, but now it's still pointing downwards. So this time, rather than have it as a subtraction, it is an addition. So together, the force normal and the force gravity is acting together when the object is on the top of the inside of the vertical loop. And that's how it, it should look like. What you want to do here is spot the difference. On top, I want you to realize that the normal force actually takes away from the centripetal force. But when it is, when the object is on the top but on the inside of the vertical loop, the normal force adds to the centripetal force of the object. Be very careful of the two different situations. Next, this is a 
pitching motion of a softball player. Notice that here, her rotation of her pitching motion behaves almost like a circular path. What I would like you to do is label the forces when the ball is on the bottom of her pitching motion and when the ball is on top of the pitching motion. Notice that her arm is part of the motion. The arm here acts like a string. So the bottom of a ball being spun at the end of an arm or a string behaves the same way. We would say that force of gravity is still pointing down. But what is pointing against force of gravity? It's not force normal here. It's force tension because it's going up the string. It's going up the pitcher's arm. When the ball's, so if we look at the equation, it would be T minus FG. And we make the same substitution as before. The realization that you should have is this behaves like the bottom of the roller coaster. But this time it's just tension that's minusing mg. So the tension force here is what is supplying the centripetal force. What happens when this is the same motion if it was also a pendulum? I want you to also be aware of that. What happens when it is on top of the circle when she pitches? Well, force gravity is still pointing down. We already know that. And it is long, right? The magnitude is large. And the force tension is also going down. So the equation for it would be the summation of the force interpretal is made up of the force gravity plus the tension force, like before, how we added the two forces together. When the ball is on top of the circle, right, on the inside of the top, we add the two forces. So it is the force gravity plus the force tension. What I want you to look at is the two scenarios here. And I'm gonna ask this question. At what point in her pitchy motion Will she feel the most tension in her arm? Okay. There is a more advanced answer if we treat because her arm is not massless. But in this situation, we assume her arm is massless so the math can work out. If we take a look at the bottom end and solve for T, we saw that it looks like this how we just add mg over to the other side. This is what tension is at the bottom of the circle. When it is on top of the circle, number five, and we saw for t, we saw that it looks like this. Notice, these two are different. When it is the bottom of the circle, it's mv squared over r plus mg. But when it's on top of the circle, it's the same thing, but it's minus mg. So at the bottom of the circle, her arm is actually feeling more tension. But when her arm's on top of the pitching motion, she feels less tension in her arms. So it hurts less when her, the ball is on the bottom and it hurts more. Sorry, it hurts less when the ball's on top because of the minus and it hurts more when the ball is on the bottom because of the addition. Here are some special cases that arise. We saw this was when the object was on top of the circle. Here we saw when the object is on top but on the inside of the circle. There's a special case that occurs only at the top of a vertical loop. At a specific speed, the object experiences circular motion which passes through the highest point of the loop and it exerts no force on the surface that is moving along on the string that it is attached to. At this special speed, the normal force in the two left scenario, I am referring to this, here and here, will become zero. So this disappears, 
this disappears, and the tension in the right will also disappear. This is at a particular speed. When the normal force or the tension force are zero, this object appears weightless. So, the way it's asked behaves like this. A question could ask, what is the maximum speed that the object can have without leaving the track or feel weightless? We know that at a particular speed, the, norm, the normal force will disappear. Or, it can be what it, when the object is on the inside of the loop, it would be the min, what is the minimum speed the object can have and still complete one loop or feel weightless. Because again, there is a force going that direction. Or, it can just be what is the minimum speed the object can have and still complete a loop. These are the three different ways a question can ask and it means the same way. The object is going to feel weightless and they're still at, at a particular speed. If you have time, there's an interesting video about the zero G plane that gives you a good understanding of weightlessness. I'm going to show you the three ways now it's particularly asked and what keywords to look for. In example one, the question could look something like this. A 0 0.2 kilogram toy cart is trying to make it up a hill with a radius of one meter. What is the maximum speed it can take without going off? In this case, and the next case, when it looks something like this, the question could be a 0 0.2 kilogram cart is trying to complete one loop with a radius of one meter. What is the minimum speed it can take to still complete it? And the third question, a 0 0.2 kilogram ball is trying to complete a circle with a radius of one meter. What is the minimum speed it can take to complete it? What I marked in red are all the different keywords here that should hint this scenario. Let's look at the calculation now. So write this down and we're going to look at actually how it's calculated. Okay, It's like this and we write the summation of the forces. Uh, the summation of force R or F force C, centripetal force, is equal to here. Force gravity is pointing it down. Force normal is going up. So we subtract N. Make that substitution. And this is what you get once you plug in what AC is. But we know that the end disappears. The end disappears at a particular velocity. That velocity is when V is equal to the square root of RG. Notice how mass cancels. When the object feels weightless, right? there's no essentially mass there. So velocity equals to the square root of RG. The second situation, same thing. But remember, force normal is now going towards the center, so we add. Make the same substitution. But now, at a particular speed, at a particular V, the N would disappear. And the object is going to feel weightless. And the M's cancel. Multiply R, square root to get V alone. You get V equals, v equals to the square root of RG. The third situation, same thing, but now it's tension that's pulling it down. It behaves the same way, mg plus t, but at a particular speed, the t disappears. It feels weightless. Mass cancels, solve for v, you get v equal to, to the square root of rg. In all three scenarios, mass cancels and V equals to the square root of the radius times gravity. So this is the special case for when an object is on top of a vertical loop. There you go. That's all you need to know about the centripetal force in the vertical direction.